to celebrate and remember who we are and what we do as scholars and teachers and to invite our extended community and colleagues to join in honoring the importance of the liberal arts. Remember that there is no conferred undergraduate degree without its required bona fides without us, without the liberal arts and sciences. Our arts and sciences courses go beyond the necessary components of a skill set that is developed and refined as part of a university general education. When I think about Professor Bachelman's title, Can the Liberal Arts Save Democracy? I'm struck by my own response. Well, aren't the liberal arts the basis for a true and good democracy? And do not the liberal arts help ensure and promote democracy? But why save? I thought democracy required the habits of mind and the virtues of tolerance and other regardingness, as well as skills of inquiry and means and reasoning that the liberal arts engender and promote. What has happened to democracy if it needs saving by a requirement that has always been there? Or is there a related question? What is the role of the liberal arts? Perhaps these two questions are related. Political theorists and philosophers advocating for various forms of political states have discussed the importance of self-development and cultivation of the self. While they may differ on the particular kind of political state that can ensure or be the basis for the cultivation and development of the self, most argue that there are circumstances that must be met for our being able to live a good life and to be, kind, to be the kind of human being that we ourselves admire. These circumstances can be understood as prerequisites and are material and institutional requirements for self-development. Can we agree on what these prerequisites are? Could they demonstrate the symbiotic and necessary relationship between the liberal arts and democracy? which would provide the foundation for and the ability to achieve our goals and the goals that we have for those whom we love, especially for our children. Might they be, one, a true democracy with equal respect and opportunity for all, especially educational opportunities? Two, a well-rounded education that expands rather than restricts career choices and employment over one's lifetime. Three, a well-rounded education that helps us thrive individually and collectively as fellow citizens of our community, state, region, nation, and the world. These are my questions that Professor Bachelman has inspired. I am pleased to introduce John Hollis, Professor Emeritus, our first annual liberal arts lecture speaker, and the individual for whom this lecture series is named. He is a well-known scholar of regional history and is widely published. For more than 30 years, John has brought historical and cultural insights to the people of Illinois through a breadth of publications, lectures, and workshops focused on literature, history, community life, environmental thought, and creative nonfiction. He reminds us of the importance of the liberal arts in facilitating self-knowledge fostering a commitment to self and others, and promoting a well-educated and concerned citizenry. Dr. Howes is our champion of a liberal arts education who continues to passionately promote the liberal arts. Thank you, John. I am most pleased to introduce Dr. John Howes. My thanks to uh, Sue Martinelli, our talented and committed uh, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences for that introduction and her insightful opening remarks. Let me say as a, as a lead-in to comments on this year's liberal arts lecturer <clears throat> that when I presented the first such lecture in 2003, I asserted that the liberal arts were under siege and in decline. <coughs> And I explained why, and then strove to connect the liberal arts with our university's heritage and its mission. And indeed, all of us who 
were associated with any university 15 years ago knew that the liberal arts were struggling in modern culture that wanted to emphasize job training, uh, narrow specialization, and so forth, rather than broad learning for self-growth. And things have gotten worse. Throughout higher education, generally, the July 6th issue of the Chronicle of Higher Education this summer, for example, has a huge, grim article on the imminent death of the humanities, the multifaceted, multi-field liberal arts component that deals directly with understanding the complex human condition and promoting our crucial quest for wisdom and justice, for appreciation and compassion. The imminent death of the humanities. And as the leader of UCLA's, for example, Higher Education Research Institute has said in a book called The Liberal Arts and Higher Education, we are now producing, because of changes that are going on, a generation of people who are simply under-educated. And of course, of course, most people who fall into that category are unaware of the dimensions of that shortcoming. And as I said in a speech to a WIU graduating class, Several years ago, people's lives are meaningful only in proportion to their awareness that there are things more important than the self or the material success and the personal acclaim that people see. Things worth caring about in an ultimate way. A culture that inspires us and a nation that unites us are two of those more important things. And now, all educated people can see evidence of that rising problem in the news every day, for that matter. And as a result, Western's honored liberal arts lecturers now all speak every year in a time of crisis. It's part of a crusade, really. And with that brief commentary on what we face, let me introduce Keith Bachelman, who chairs the Department of Political Science here. He grew up, by the way, in our own region, in nearby Quincy, and between his undergraduate and graduate study years, he was also a staff member at the Illinois House of Representatives. So he had some on-site experience with the challenges in government these days. Aside from eventually earning his doctorate at the University of Illinois, he has taught at Texas A&M University, at Louisiana State University and at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. In the mid-1990s, he also taught uh, for a time at a university in Germany. He's been a professor at WIU since 1998. And among other things, he has won the College of Arts and Sciences Teaching Award. So you can expect a good talk. <laughs> As I mentioned in a recent newspaper article, too, partly uh, mentioning this uh, occasion, he's also the co-author of a fine book, uh, one of two or three books that he's done, as a matter of fact, but a fine book that is focused on Barack Obama's pre-presidential years, a book that necessarily gets into some huge, ongoing American issues. So this year's liberal arts lecturer can obviously see the deep connection between the liberal arts and our democratic 
Society. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to present Western's 2018 Liberal Arts Lecturer, Keith Bachelman, speaking on Can the Liberal Arts Save Democracy? This idea is also spread to the larger culture. This recent book by Farid Zakaria in the Festival of Liberal Arts carries this message to the John mentioned. Zakaria argues the skills you learn in the liberal arts disciplines are actually more beneficial on the job market than many people believe. He quotes Drew Galvin Faust, president of Harvard, who argues that a liberal arts education prepares you for your sixth job not your first. More recently, a study by Google analyzed hiring, firing, and promotion data among their employees. It found that the skills associated with liberal arts education were better predicting employee success than technical expertise. And you can see some of these up here. They include things like communicating and listening well, possessing insights into others, having empathy, being a good critical thinker, problem solver, and making connections across complex ideas. Other defenders of liberal arts emphasize how they contribute to the quality of one's life in a broader sense, making it richer. Later on, Shore has developed a program, the Clemente Course, named after the Pittsburgh Pirates outfielder and philanthropist, to teach low income people liberal arts subjects, particularly the humanities. He argued that liberal arts enriches people both materially and socio culturally. He quotes a student who took the course who said, the people are poor because they don't have the moral life of downtown. In this case, he met Man she met Manhattan. Plays, museums, concerts, lectures, you know. Shores himself added, society has already denied them the access to the very works and ideas that bring people legitimate power to democracy. That's why they are poor and why their parents are poor. I'm going to focus on a little bit different line of defense tonight, however, although one that's kind of anticipated by the quote I just read you. <laughs> the liberal arts aren't the only thing with liberal in their name that's under attack. Liberal democracy is as well. The events of the last few years have led many to question the viability of liberal democracy, and a spate of books has appeared on its theme. Here's a sample. You can see the title is fairly ominous. Um, the book argues that democratic norms, such as the commitment to freedom of the press, or the belief in free and fair elections, where everyone accepts the outcomes are under fire. Then there's this one that argues that the public's belief in democracy was eroded, especially among the young. Another concern is because politics is often tribal, democracy tends to enable hostility and persecution of people who are outside one's group. And this is just a few examples. Really, it's just Harvard and Yale. If I, if I could spend the whole night on those books to talk about the crisis of democracy right now. But a common theme in these books is that liberal democracy with this concern about rights, such as freedom of speech, or freedom of the press, or the rights of minorities, is looking out the populist democracy. In a populist democracy, the people rule with fewer checks on their passions and emotions. There's less concern with minority rights. I want to be clear then that I'm using the term li liberal in its traditional sense of related to individual liberty rather than its contemporary ideological sense. Well, so what? A lot of things are under attack. Do the liberal arts and liberal democracy have anything else in common linking them together? Many of America's leading intellectuals believe that they do. Martin Nussbaum at the University of Chicago argues that young people need a liberal arts education to, quote, inform themselves about the issues they will address as voters. Andrew Dobonko at Columbia University 
use the liberal arts as a quote rehearsal space for democracy. What he means by that is it can help us practice debating contentious issues with civility and respect, it can teach us to transcend our passions, help us think through difficult questions, and lead us to change our minds when that's necessary. I started my career with similar beliefs to those of Nussbaum and Delbanco, that the liberal arts can nurture liberal democracy. I haven't lost that belief, but it has been tested. Along the way, these questions have led me to try to conduct my own research involving students here at Western concerning how the liberal arts curriculum can nurture liberal democracy. And I'll say a little bit more about those experiments later. I defined liberal democracy already, but defining liberal arts is a little trickier. I don't want to do so in terms of list disciplines, but let me touch on a couple of characteristics that will be relevant to my later argument. First, the liberal arts are tied to writing, analysis, and thinking. Writing in particular is central to Fariza Carey's defense of the liberal arts that I mentioned earlier, because it's so closely connected to thinking. Second, the liberal arts involves a style of learning where you have extensive faculty student and student to student engagement. There's an emphasis on discussion and participation, which are clearly democratic concerns as well. I think of the debate we were having last spring between the Student Government Association and the Faculty Senate about whether it's appropriate to grade for class participation. The liberal arts tradition, at least as I see it, implies a direct participation in one's learning is critical. Historically, the liberal arts and democracy merged together in ancient Greece, especially Athens. But they really came together in the Enlightenment era. In fact, in many ways, modern de liberal democracy is a creature of the Enlightenment, with belief in science, reasoning, and the use of evidence to make decisions. French President Emmanuel Macron expressed the Enlightenment view in his speech to Congress in April. Without reason, without truth, there is no real democracy. Is not democracy about true choices and rational decisions. The Enlightenment view sees debate and conversation rather than decree as the way to solve problems. The Enlightenment ideal is a cosmopolitan ideal because it encourages information from as many sources and views as possible. So I think it's pretty easy to see how the liberal arts would nurture an Enlightenment view of liberal democracy. A liberal arts education teaches people to reason defend their views of debate, and use a scientific method. It should help them evaluate arguments and assess input from a variety of sources. It should help them understand the diverse views of a wide variety of people, living and dead, in their own countries and throughout the world. It's the opposite of Twitter. <laughs> it's not surprising then that Thomas Jefferson, Mr. Enlightenment, perhaps our most liberal arts president, explicitly linked education and liberal democracy. Despite his famous skepticism about the value of degrees of art, art history, which he later kind of retracted, I think of President Obama as another of our most liberal arts presidents. His first inaugural address seemed to exemplify enlightened notions of liberal democracy, resting on liberal arts principles. And here are a few quotes. We will restore science to its rightful place. We know that our casual heritage is a strength, not a weakness. The lies of tribes will soon dissolve. Okay, well, that didn't quite pan out the way it's <laughs> We're going to revisit President Obama's views later, but for now, we're going to focus on someone far less interesting me. <laughs> when I became a professor, even before I had enlightened ideals about the role of liberal arts and liberal. I believe that if we can educate people to reason about problems and think about facts, we'd have a better liberal democracy. I believe that scientific reasoning, although I wasn't always quite sure political science was a science, but we'll just leave that there. Um, <laughs> I believe in cosmopolitan ideals and diversity, but also that people can reach consensus through reason and conversation. My experience and exposure to scholarship showed me that it was more complicated. Things didn't pan out quite the way I expected either. So, maybe I was a little naive. Years ago, in my first tenure track job, I taught a class called Ethics and Public Policy. 
In this class, we started off the semester by learning about some of the basic ethical theories. So we covered utilitarianism, the idea the greatest good for the greatest number, Rawls egalitarianism, notion society should do their best for the worst off person, notion libertarianism, the concept that we should maximize individual freedom, and communitarianism, which is a little bit hard to explain the sound bite, but it essentially includes the idea of looking at societal stories and narratives to understand ethical behavior. Then we apply these ideas to some of the major issues of the day. I assume that if I expose students to these different perspectives, it'll open up their minds to different ways of thinking about policy and they might change their views. What really happened is the various theories gave them ammunition to justify what they already believed in the first place. I like teaching the class a lot, but I found this troubling. I've taught a similar class at Western a few times, uh, and experienced a similar dynamic, but I was a little bit more prepared for it now, and I also tried to expose students to a more scientific view or perspective on ethics. In doing so, I stumbled on the idea of motivated reasoning. This concept casts doubt on the ability of citizens to deliberate or make decisions in a reasonable way. The motivated reasoning research suggests that people don't make decisions about politics and public policy by thinking them through or weighing out the pros and cons. Instead, they develop their preferences based on emotions, intuition, and group identification, and use reason to justify them. An analogy developed by the social scientist Jonathan Haidt is the reason the press secretary for the emotions. So in other words, we have an emotional reaction to things, and we make most of our political decisions and policies just based on emotions then our reason explains why we believe what we do. So we resist, resist letting go of what we already believe. To me, this is the crux of the problem from a democracy standpoint. If no one changes their minds, it's really hard to see how the country addresses policy problems effectively or engages in any kind of productive debate. Now, I'm not saying that anyone should, everyone should constantly flip-flopping or not have principles. I'm not saying that at all. But I do agree with this quote from Diana Hess and Paula McAvoy in their book, The Political Classroom, that there is an educational and democratic value in considering the question, could I be wrong? Fundamentally, for liberal democracy to work, people should be open-minded enough to change their views when the evidence warrants it. So when I just discuss my experiments and quasi-experiments later, the key thing I will be analyzing is the conditions that lead people to change their minds. Open mind is even more fundamental, however, in the sense that it relates to the willingness to grant rights and voice to people we disagree with, something that populist democracy fails to do. I should also say that people do change their minds on political questions all the time. As many examples I'm going to talk about in a minute will show. It's just they don't necessarily change their minds based on reason and fact. Our emotions come up with whatever position we have on something, then reason has to explain it. There are a lot of examples of this, so let's take the economy. So this chart here essentially shows Democratic and Republican views of the economy during various presidencies. So the blue line is Democratic views, the red line is Republican views. And you can see what I've been about to argue doesn't really apply during the Clinton administration so much, although for reasons I'm not completely sure of, but certainly during the George W. Bush administration, the Obama administration, and you can see on the ends that it also during the applied during the George H.W. Bush administration and the um, early days of the Trump administration. So what's essentially happening here is that people change their views of the economy based on who's in office. You can see right around the election there's a sudden switch where they kind of cross streams a little bit and then uh, if there's a Republican president, Republicans think things are going great, uh, and Democrat, uh, Democrats vice versa. So, you know, essentially people are not directly assessing reality or looking at facts, they're looking at the cues from uh, their leaders or, or who's in charge or whether they believe in them or not. Now some examples of how emotion and intuition override reason are kind of charming. For example, people who vote in schools are more likely to support school funding. Others are wacky. One study found that shark attacks on the New Jersey shore in the summer of 1916 cost Woodrow Wilson, the incumbent president, about 10% of the vote he would, he would have otherwise gotten in beach towns in the election the following fall. <laughs> so in other words, people were blaming these shark attacks on the president, punishing him 
because there were shark attacks, which of course you guys don't control. <laughs> Cities where teams win sports championships are more likely to support the party in power in upcoming elections. So if you add all this up, it turns out many people, including Thomas Jefferson and Emmanuel Macron and Barack Obama and Martin Mosbaum and Anthony Del Baco and me expect the liberal democracy to work is kind of troubling. People don't use enlightenment ideals of reasoning. Thomas Jefferson himself did when he engaged in motivated reasoning about race. People don't want to debate and test their ideas. They want to reinforce what they and their group already believe. In one experiment, people were offered different amounts of money to read studies they either agreed with or disagreed with. Most people gave them a chance to, read, to earn more money by reading a study they disagreed with and instead took less money to read a study they agreed with. This dynamic is especially pernicious due to polarization. In the contemporary United States, as well as other parts of the world, the other party is currently viewed as not as people who disagree with on issues and reason with. Instead, they are an enemy that must be crushed. The liberal democratic ideal of reason debate leading to better policies is hard to realize in these circumstances. So, liberal arts education is a rescue, right? At least part of what liberal education is doing is helping people reason better, right? It should help people change their minds when appropriate, shouldn't it? Well, not so fast. For me, one of the most troubling aspects of this research is that better educated people are more likely to use motivated reasoning. They use their superior cognitive skills to explain or justify their parts of beliefs rather than to better assess reality. One particularly striking study looked at what happens when mathematical reasoning skills collide with political preferences. So researchers gave people different versions of the same math problem. And I'll show you a chart here. Essentially, they presented in one perspective the problem about figuring out whether skin cream worked to help people's skin rash. In another instance, they presented the same problem as a gun control policy problem. And so essentially what you have here is four, four different versions of the same thing. Uh, the answer is essentially um, the bottom, combination of the bottom left and the top right. So in the top left quadrant here, um, the skin control treatment worked. In the top right, it didn't work. And C, gun control policies work. In D, they didn't. But it's basically the same math in every case. So um, you know, the, the math is no different. As a whole, people were less likely to get the answer right when it presented a gun control problem as a skincare treatment problem. But more significantly, in my view, is the better you are at math, the relatively more likely you were to get the gun control problem wrong. Huh. So if you're, better, if you're better at math, you're likely to get the skincare treatment right, you're more likely to get the skincare treatment right, but you're more likely to get the gun control problem wrong. So this point here, I guess, is that not only can political education make people worse at political decision making, teach them to be better at math can too. So learning more about math actually makes you worse at math when you're dealing with political problems. <laughs> There's a lot of pressure to live up to group expectations, and the smarter and better anything we are, the more likely we are to figure out clever ways to present our emotions as reasonable. So again, let me emphasize that education and or intelligence don't counteract motivated reasoning on their own. In fact, sometimes they can make it worse. This realization has led me to the question of how a liberal arts education might mitigate motivated reasoning and support liberal democracy. To answer that, I've looked at some of the literature on motivated reasoning, as well as doing some experiments in my own classes, and here's what I've concluded. First, simply instructing students to be objective or unbiased, or people in general, is unlikely to work, maybe the backfire. People often adapt, and I think it therefore must be true, mindset, mean by definition, if they think something is true, it must be objective. Therefore, emphasizing objectivity only makes it for people more committed to what they already believe. Second, what I would call drive-by pro-con approaches are also likely to backfire. This is a common technique in political science, but also used in other disciplines, and here's a couple of examples. And I've done this frequently in my own class and even some of the experiments I'm going to talk about later, but I'm increasingly convinced it's not the way to go. 
It's too easy to pick out arguments for your side to reinforce your view and downplay those of the other side. Academic studies also support this. For example, in a classic study, when people were given arguments on both sides of the death penalty, they became more firmly convinced of their own position rather than moderating it based on um, new evidence. Reading articles you disagree with even makes you read more slowly because you insert your critiques as you go along. Now, alternatively, I would say providing depth and multifaceted perspectives on issues is more likely to counteract motivated reasoning. So I'm not suggesting that instructors shouldn't provide different viewpoints and perspectives, but just be careful about presenting them in the simplistic pro-con fashion, particularly if it's aligned with stereotypically liberal or conservative or Republican or Democratic views. Third, official liberal arts emphasis on writing also combats motivated reasoning. Because requiring people to explain things promotes real reasoning. In other words, long-form writing promotes nuance and complexity. If writing promotes effective individual reasoning, then deliberation can be the group analogy. People can also change their mind when they deliberate, but it only happens under certain conditions, not just yelling or reciting talking. For avoiding the framing of issues counteracts motivated reasoning. There's a lot of evidence that people's views on issues come from their group identification and cues from leaders, again, rather than reasoning through questions. And one example of this might be the climate change global warming issue. So this slide shows a Republican Democratic views 20 years ago and today. As you can see, um, 20 years ago, they were pretty close. About half believed that global warming was happening. But since that time, there's been a complete polarization. There's, there's a much larger gap. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this, but I think a lot of it has been just due to the leaders of parties saying that this is the party position and people sort of falling in line for that. So I've done some experiments in my own class to try to assess the effects of these last two issues, liberation and Elite framing. So let's start with elite framing. I've always liked to assign articles and books by politicians. I felt that they give students more access to the real world, but I've begun to worry that it may be a mistake given the motivated reasoning literature. The material that comes from easily identifiable partisan or ideological sources may inhibit students' willingness to accept factual information or to change their minds. So the fall of 2016 and fall of 2017, I did a study to see how the lead framing of issues affected students' willingness to change their minds. Each time I was teaching two sections of American government, early in the semester, students in both sections were given a survey about their position on gun control, and I also asked them who they would or did support for President 2016 election. Later in the term, students were assigned pro and con readings on gun control, which we then discussed in class. In the control group, the articles of labor with a real, relatively low pro profile office, so no one really knew who they were. In the experimental group, the anti gun control article was labeled with Donald Trump as the author, and the pro gun control um, article had Hillary Clinton as the author. Now, thinking back on this, I really wanted to mess up, I would have switched that, but. <laughs> <laughs> so students wrote a brief reaction to the arguments in the read, just didn't discuss them. After doing so, they were given a follow-up survey about gun control. Now, the results surprised me a little bit in the context of the motivated reasoning literature I referred to earlier. I expected that motivated reasoning would lead people to be less likely to change their minds in the experimental condition. The basic idea is that seeing articles written by Trump or Clinton would shut down critical thinking for people for their supporters. On the other hand, it was also possible to simply shift their positions based on cues from political figures they identified with or against. So this chart kind of lays out what happened. About twice as many students who read the articles falsely labeled as being written by Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump changed their minds as opposed to those written by the real authors. So that was kind of against my hypothesis. Um, so I thought, well, okay, let's look at Hillary Clinton here. Uh, there's a lot of people changing their minds who were her supporters, so maybe they're changing their minds in her direction. So maybe they're going from an anti-gun control stance to a pro-gun control stance because they're being cued by Hillary Clinton. That didn't really happen either. In fact, it was just the opposite. Both people who changed their minds actually changed their minds uh, in an anti-gun control direction. 
So you may not be surprised to hear this has not been published yet in my, in my hypothesis to work. What's kind of hiding in the weeds here is that I think motivated reasoning is not intractable, particularly when students are exposed to techniques of liberal arts education, such as reading, writing, discussion, all these things that we're trying to promote. So it's possible some of the research I cited earlier is to negative regard the likelihood of people change their minds based on evidence at least at this age, but especially again when they are both and they are exposed to the techniques of liberal arts education. I did another experiment in the spring of 16 um, dealing with deliberation. Due to concerns about polarization, threat to liberal democracy, pro deliberative organizations emerge in the real world. Uh, one example is Better Angels. Its name references this quote from uh, Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address at the beginning of the Civil War. And his methodology is essentially to bring conservatives and liberals together and have them try to discuss issues in a moderated way to reduce the stereotypes and try to promote shared reasoning and finding common ground. So I wanted to test whether doing something similar in a classroom setting with these students to be more open-minded. And so I'm not going to go into all the details of this one because my methodology is kind of a joke and I don't really want to talk about that. But um, again, I sort of found the opposite of what I expected, or at least it went really nothing. The deliberation didn't seem to make much difference um, compared to just regular class discussion. But here again, I guess what was hiding in the weeds, the 40% of the students changed their minds just based on the things we do in the liberal arts curriculum, uh, requiring close reading, uh, discussion, and writing. So I suspect in this, Experiment two, I used the pro-con kind of framework. I expect if I would have used that, that there would have been even more people changing their minds, perhaps. Better research has been done in high school. Social studies class being found when teachers set aside at least 20% of the time for discussion, requires students to prepare in advance, and whether it's significant student-to-student -student talk, pro-democracy outcomes emerge. So students became more interested in and knowledgeable about politics more willing to listen to others with different viewpoints. So again, I think there are things that we can and are doing in liberal arts classrooms that help students reason about policy better. But I also think there's another step to this, and that involves the role of emotions in the curriculum. Going back to the ethics and public policy class I mentioned earlier, things often got very emotional. Students would yell, students would cry, some level I thought this was good, at least people weren't bored. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like other class where I was trying to explain that there was been a council manager and mayor council for our local government. <laughs> but at another level, I was a little bit uncomfortable with this intensity. College is supposed to be about thinking, not emoting. Damn it. <laughs> and while I'm not naive enough to think that politics isn't largely about emotions, I, like many, I view this as a negative. Emotions are often dangerous in politics, whether it's demagogues or James Madison's famous warnings about the mischiefs of faction. We often praise a politician or someone else in public life by saying they are the voice of reason. We rarely hear someone commend for being the voice of emotion. And that's how I tend to think of it. The reason the antithesis of emotion and that emotion is a negative force in politics. I've come to believe that I'm wrong or at least incompletely informed on both counts. So let me begin with the relationship with reason between reason and emotion. I want to stress that I'm not against reason, not for it. But I've also come to recognize the political theorist Daniel Allen. Daniel Allen puts it, reason, interest, and emotion cannot be disentangled. The emotional context affects how people reason, and here's a historical example. The campaign of peace talks in the late 70s between Israel and Egypt after 13 days of talks, he had essentially broken down. Menachem Begin, Israeli Prime Minister, refused to budge or remove the Israeli settlements from Egyptian territory. This slide is for President Jimmy Carr's account of what happened next. And I'll, I'll read this to you. Um, so before the evening, Begin had requested signed photographs 
for each of his eight grandchildren. So instead of just saying, best wishes to Jimmy Carter, Carter said, I put love and best wishes to it, I put the names of his grandchildren. He maybe was quite angry with me at the time. But he called out the name of his first grandchild, and then he called out the name of his second grandchild, and he had tears running down his shoes, and so did I. Then he said, in fact, why don't we try one more time? And so we tried one more time and we were successful. Again, reason, interest, and emotion cannot be disentangled. Emotions are the catalyst for making us change his mind and continue negotiations. That doesn't mean he threw digital bargaining interest out the window, rejected logic and argument, but emotion did lead him to reframe the situation. So can the liberal arts curriculum do something similar? can use emotion and courage to reframe their situation in a way that's beneficial for democracy. I think it can, and let me explain. I've always believed in experiential learning, and large is a way to help students engage the material. But what stared me in the face for years, and I never quite put together, is that experiential learning works because it engages the emotions. Whether it's service learning, internships, simulations, and games conducted inside or outside of class, like the mock election, by engaging in most experiential learning also promotes policy knowledge that can lead people to change their minds. As one example, a study in Hungary found that playing a game took the perspective of an 18-year-old Roma boy led a significant and lasting reduction of prejudice, not only against the Roma, but also with respect to other stigmatized groups, such as refugees. So let me talk about another study I did work with my colleague Aaron Taylor as part of an American political thought class in the fall semester of 2016 and 2017. This course had a strong experiential learning element and tried to recreate the past and emotions of politics. Students participated in a simulation game developed by the Reacting to Past Consortium that stressed the impact of suffrage and union movements, among others, in the early 20th century United States. Students researched and played period appropriate roles, including the suffragists and labor activists, they gave and listened to speeches, organized protests, and carried out other political activities. So they reasoned with others about the events in the past that resonated in the present, but in doing so, they also built emotional connections, both to their own roles and to each other. This role-playing aspect of the activity forced them to step outside their moral political identities to empathize with the roles they themselves played, as well as those of the others that have it. So we did a before and after survey to try to assess the impact of this experience, and we found big changes in perspective in a variety of areas. To cite just one example, before the simulation began, 42% of students considered themselves feminists, while 61% did afterwards. Shifting one's position was especially prevalent, prevalent among men, suggesting the game promoted understanding of people different than oneself at a more fundamental level in policy. Now, of course, ideally you want to compare this to a study that, you know, where you did this in a regular class. But what I took from this is that the liberal arts curriculum needs to nurture and build on the emotional connection between students and to some degree between students and faculty who are built in classrooms. In the ethics, Aristotle argues that friendship is a road to rationality and an ethical life. Contemporary social scientists echo Aristotle, finding that people are more apt to change their minds when their friends bring up new points of view and arguments. And this idea, of course, echoes Lincoln's comments that I showed you earlier. So let's move on to my second misconception about emotions, that they are solely a negative force in politics. In thinking about my teacher, I realized I've almost always presented emotions in a negative light. This painting is kind of a visual excuse me, representation of how I've seen it. So you've got some kind of insane, emotional, crazy person like Hitler, who's out there screaming and yelling, and rounding up people and throwing them in the concentration camps and doing all kinds of other terrible things and rotting up people and then that's all bad. I've estimated that I've taught American government something like 68 times in my career. Every single one of them we talked about the Federalist Number 10 and how it warned the dangers of emotion and democracy. But I've come to realize I don't think I've paid enough attention to the positive role of emotions in political life and how a liberal arts education can nurture them. I think the last quasi-experiment in Professor Taylor's class that we just discussed illustrates this. This idea has also been a recurrent theme of the Hawes lectures. But here I'm going to quote Michael Roth, the president of Western University, 
quote, critical thinking is sterile and have the capacity for empathy and comprehension that stretches the self. Empathy sets the stage for people to change their mind, which again is central to the idea of a successful liberal democracy. One study, for example, in promoting empathy can reduce transgender prejudice. In the study, campus would let people talk about their own experience of being attacked or facing discrimination. People change their mind, people they reflected on their own experiences, they realize they didn't want others to suffer. Now, I don't have this all work out in terms of which emotion should be, besides empathy, which I think is a good one, should be outside of the curriculum. For example, there are some emotions that are considered negative, they sometimes lead to positive political change, like anger. In fact, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with my own conclusion here because I don't want education to become a form of emotional manipulation or indoctrination. At the same time, denying the educational role of emotions can lead to its own problems, it creates a kind of excessive attachment. I'm going to quote Michael Roth again. He writes, the inquirer is thinking of the guy who's a sophisticated and often ironic spectator rather than the message participant in ongoing experiments or the reverent beholder of great cultural achievements. Liberal arts teachers should be guides, not judges, to help students learn to add value, not just criticize. What he's saying here, I think, is that while critical thinking should be nurtured, emotional engagement is key to cultivating the kind of person who will be a good citizen in a democracy. So to summarize so far, many of the techniques of liberal arts education do seem to help in overcoming motivated reasoning particularly critical thinking, excuse me, critical reading, writing, and discussion, as do tools such as scientific method and logical reasoning. We also need to think more about the emotional conditions that lead people to use these techniques effectively when reasoning about real-world controversies. That's one of the lessons of the math problem experiment I discussed earlier. It's not just a matter of teaching people math, but teaching them how to find the right answer when it works against their pre-existing commitments. Experiential learning approaches may be particularly useful in fostering this transference of what students will be learning in class, the application in everyday life. <laughs> Let me talk about a few other curricular concerns. There's some evidence that explicitly covering the role of emotions in policies can mitigate the negative effects of emotional appeals. Another study showed that curricular breadth can counteract motivated reasoning. This study argues that high schools do a better job of moderating political opinions than colleges do because the latter has a more specialized curriculum. This obviously has important implications for general education. So a part of me wants to stop here. You may want that too. <laughs> but there's another issue that needs to be addressed, whether liberal democracy is worth saving. That's been my underlying assumption, of course, but is it correct? Is it time for liberal democracy to go the way of communism or fascism as once contemporary competitors? This governing system that now appears to fade away. The journalist and academic Stephen Kinzer, writing at the 2016 election, makes the extreme case of liberal democracy as had today. He writes, democracy is retreat around the world. Today's cry of protest is the rejection of the Enlightenment. Voters are making it clear they want to be ruled with a strong hand, not rule themselves. And the primates instinctively prefer a strong chief that protects the tribe, or return a tribe member to the chief's committee. Well, I think that's kind of overstating the case myself, um, for a number of reasons. Just to cite one, polls show that America's desire for a strong leader has fallen since the 2016 election. <laughs> um, still, as alluded to in the beginning, it's increasingly clear that the public's commitment to liberal dem democratic ideas is pretty shallow and largely stems from the apparent economic benefits that seem to be associated with liberal democracy. It's not freedom of speech or minority rights that people crave, unfortunately, in my view, but the economic growth that seems to be associated with liberal democracy. But I'm going to defend liberal democracy. I already learned in doing so, I'm probably engaged in my own form of motivated reasoning. It's likely that my own emotional commitments to liberal democracy rather than our priori analysis costs and benefits for what's driving me. But I'm okay with that. With that out of the way, to start with liberal democracies tend to do better on utilitarian measures such as health, income, and life expectancy. They have higher rates of economic growth, fewer wars and genocides, have healthier and better educated citizens, and virtually no famines. If you 
If you ask people, say, Venezuela, Turkey, or Hungary, where their lives have gotten better, as little democracies eroded, I'm not sure they would say they would. But moving beyond the utilitarian, and contrary to reports of widespread disdain for liberal democracy among the young, I found a strong commitment to liberal democracy and a better functioning liberal democracy among my students. In discussing my experience in their aftermath, I found that people were highly engaged with the ideas, deeply concerned about the state of the liberal democracy. They haven't rejected the ideas of liberal democracy, but they want something better regardless of their party or candidate they favor. So I think that what liberal arts scholars and educators need to work on is how to improve liberal democracy or think about what we should replace it with. As some of the comments earlier suggest, I'm sympathetic to a more deliberative form of democracy, but that's only one possibility. I'm not in favor of an aristocracy, because as I mentioned earlier, the cognitive elite is certainly not except for motivated reasons, as many historical examples show. I also would say that the Democracy Improvement Project doesn't just involve political scientists. For example, this recent book analyzed some of the challenges facing contemporary democracy through the lens of Shakespeare. It contains insights into issues like the role of parties and the essence of enabling a bad leader to satisfy personal ambition. So I said earlier I'd come back to President Obama. In his farewell address, he looks back with a less confident but still somewhat hopeful view of American democracy. And he touches on some of the themes I've addressed tonight. So in that speech, he said, for too many of us, it becomes safe to retreat into our own bubbles surrounded by people who look like us and share the same political outlook and never challenge our assumptions. This trend is a threat to our democracy. So if nothing else, a little arts education should challenge our assumptions. It should puncture our bubbles. But again, it's more likely to do so if we attend to the emotional conditions that allow people to have their bubbles punctured. So I'd like to close, and I really will this time, I return to the question we gave this lecture's title, Can the Liberal Arts Save Democracy? Certainly not on their own, but the Liberal Arts can nurture democracy. As John mentioned years ago, I taught an exchange program at the University of Fort Worth, Germany. In talking to some of the faculty there, I found that the Liberal Arts disciplines were the most, ones that were most corrupted under authoritarian rule. So maybe I should say that the Liberal Arts and Liberal Democracy nurture each other. Obtaining a liberal arts education and living in a liberal democracy are incredibly valuable things that make it easy to take for granted. I believe we can pass both on to the next generation. When I came to Western 20 years ago, I thought this was the best place for me to do that, to pass on a liberal democracy and a liberal arts education. I hope that my colleagues and I in college can do this vital work. Let me conclude with a few thank yous. Uh, thank you, John, for starting this lecture series and um, for uh, keeping it going. Thank you, Dean Sue, for your unwavering commitment to the liberal arts. Um, I'd like to thank my department for their support throughout this. Um, John Cooley and Julia Alvarez in particular for nominating me. I'd like to thank Sharon Knight for all the work she's done to organize this, but also uh, to deal with my neurosis of putting this together. So thank you for sharing. <laughs> Um, and thank you, Sarah, my wife, for all your support during this and being the sound report for me.